Hello, my name is Debbie Young and I'm the co-chair of the Brain Day Organising Committee. It gives me great pleasure this afternoon to welcome you to uh, the last of our public uh, our lectures uh, given by Professor Debbie Hay. Uh, Debbie Hay is a uh, current James Cook Research Fellow and she's from the School of Biological Sciences. And so today what she's going to tell you about is something about her research which is focused on migraines and headaches. Uh, Debbie. great pleasure to be here this afternoon. I'm really pleased that my flight was on time this morning. I came in from Shanghai, where I was presenting um, at an exciting conference there. And so I really hope my presentation goes smoothly. But if something does go wrong, please forgive me. Um, I shall blame it on a little bit of jet lag. So migraines and headaches then. Why am I here talking to you about this today? Well, migraine affects one in five New Zealand women. This means that out of this audience, there are bound to be people here who either are directly affected by this or know someone who is affected by this. Migraine is a really important condition, and I'm going to talk to you about a number of different aspects relating to this today. Let's start with a few facts. So, migraine is more common than diabetes, epilepsy, and asthma combined. One in seven people overall suffer from migraine, and that's one billion globally. However, less than half of those with migraine actually see a doctor about it. Now, why that is is not completely clear. Maybe they've given up going to see their doctor because they feel they can't be helped, or maybe they just sort of live through it and, and think there's nothing that can be done probably lots of different underlying reasons. For those who do seek help, finding a doctor, a headache doctor, is incredibly difficult because there are very few hours committed to headache training in medical school. In the US, where there are specialist headache practitioners, there are very few of them, and this makes it really difficult for people to get the right treatment that they actually need. <coughs> Importantly, this is a really costly condition to the economy. It costs the individually, individual hugely in their day-to-day -day life, but it also costs the economy enormously because people will often have difficulty attending work, for example. So I'm going to go through these different aspects today. So I'm going to explain to you what migraine is. If you don't know, this is going to help you understand this condition. I'll talk about migraine treatment, a little bit of history, where we are now and where the future is heading. And in particular, I'm going to talk about a class of molecules, a new class of molecules that are really offering hope to many sufferers for the first time. But also, this is not the end. We have some new hope but there's an awful lot more that we don't know and a lot more that we can do. And that relates in part to our research going on here at the University of Auckland. So let's start with, what is migraine? This quote here, I think, does sum this up quite nicely. Chronic migraine, grave, disabling, and leave, receiving little attention. Chronic migraine is a disease of great detrimental influence on a patient's life. I like that quote, I think it sums it up. But if we look at this a little bit more closely, we'll start with what migraine is not. Migraine is not the same as a headache. There is a lot more to migraine. When we think about migraine, yes, headache, that is something that definitely springs to mind, but that is not the only aspect. It's classified as a disabling primary headache disorder, so that's different to a secondary headache disorder, such as a hangover, for example. So this is a disabling primary headache disorder. And what's really fascinating about migraine is it's so diverse. Every single person will experience migraine a little bit differently. And that word experience is really important here. Migraine is an experience, and it's really unique. I haven't listed here the large number of different subtypes of migraine classification. I'm happy to talk to you more about that if you'd like. So we'll keep it relatively simple and broad. 
It does frequently include severe headache, and that's usually on one side of the head principally, so a unilateral, one-sided, throbbing headache. And you will usually have it on the same side every time. But actually, not every migraine sufferer gets headache. And often in children, migraine doesn't involve headache at all, at least not to start with. And that makes it really difficult to diagnose. Migraineurs will frequently be super sensitive to their environment, not necessarily all the time, but when a migraine is coming on, they will usually start to feel much more sensitive to their environment. Light will just start to be a little bit more problematic. Light can sometimes even cause pain. There'll be hypersensitivity to sound, smell, touch, and touch is something we don't tend to think about so much, but actually you will often be um, hypersensitive to sensation. And there will often be gastrointestinal disturbances. Nausea and vomiting are very frequent. Now many people will have what's known as acute migraines. So they might have one or two migraines a month, for example. But what can happen over time is that this can become chronic migraine. So acute or episodic migraine can chronify, as it's called, and become chronic migraine. And this means that approximately half of the month you have a headache. And you can imagine the impact of that on an individual. This does often start in childhood, affects people through much of their adult life, and it does tend to disappear with ageing. A benefit, I have been told, of getting old. But it's really interesting because migraine just sometimes comes and goes. You, you'll talk to people and they say, yes, I used to suffer from migraine, and then just one day it went away. This is what makes it a really challenging condition to study. Now, migraine aura I haven't mentioned so far, but this is a series of symptoms that not everybody gets, but many people do get, and these are sorts of visual disturbances, for example. And I think a really nice way of illustrating this is with this image here. So it's said that Van Gogh actually was a migraine sufferer. And migraine was considered back then to be a mild insanity. And that's because people didn't understand it. And it is really thought that Van Gogh's migraine auras inspired much of his work. And you'll find that many migraine sufferers are incredibly creative. Is this because they experience the world slightly differently? Another famous migraine sufferer was Lewis Carroll. Again, an example where perhaps his incredible work, such as this, um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, were in fact inspired by his experiences and his aura. More recently, um, migraine art has become a really good way of helping people to explain their symptoms. If you do not suffer from migraine, it's incredibly difficult to get across to someone else. If you do suffer, if you don't suffer, having that conversation is really hard. And migraine art is a really nice way of doing that. And there's some really great work that if you, if you look um, in this book or on the Migraine Action site, you can see how people are explaining their migraines. And recently, there's been an initiative in the last few years um, called Migraine Moments. And this is an initiative worldwide where people record their own videos of their own experiences. And it's a really interesting way of helping to understand and have a conversation about migraine. To illustrate how migraine is much more than a bad headache, I'm going to try and play you this short clip. CBS News' Serene Branson is live at the Staples Center with highlights and backstage coverage we're seeing for the very first time. Serene. Well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy divertation tonight. We had a very Darrison bite. Let's go to Terrace Chase and look for the bit. They have the pet. So you could understand that, of course, perfectly. <laughs> what was happening was there, and people were really concerned about this at the time. They thought that news reporter was having a stroke on air because her speech was so disturbed. In fact, she was having a migraine. She couldn't understand what had happened then. 
Um, and it was quite shocking for a lot of people who watched that video. But this just shows you how migraine can affect an individual during an acute attack. And so just to reinforce to you, migraine is much more than a bad headache. It is, in fact, a complex neurological disorder. And so what triggers a migraine attack? Those of you who suffer from migraine, or perhaps family members of migraineurs, will know that you spend a lot of your time trying to avoid triggers. You live in fear of certain things that you know will cause a migraine. That can be stress. It can be the menstrual cycle in women. It can be changes in weather, even. These can all bring on a migraine attack in different individuals. Co some common migraine triggers are shown here. Bright light, caffeine, red wine, and perfume. So very strong smells. And in fact, I attend a number of different headache conferences around the world. And on their um, rules, do not wear strong perfume to the conference because this is not very good for your colleagues in the audience if they are migraine sufferers. So we know that a number of different things like this can trigger an attack, but what happens in the brain with an attack? This is the really simple version. Triggers cause activation of the so-called trigeminovascular system. So we all have a nerve called the trigeminal nerve or the fifth cranial nerve. And this is the major nerve in the face and head that is important for sensation and for pain. We know that these triggers activate that system. We also know that there are lots of different parts of the brain within the central nervous system and outside the brain in the peripheral nervous system that are involved in a migraine attack. And in fact, it's incredibly complex. Now, this is a complex diagram, but I'm just going to point out three components of this that are important to understand, which is that a migraine does involve blood vessels relaxing, vasodilation, vasoconstriction. There are definitely effects on blood vessels. We also know that there is release of uh, molecules that cause inflammation. And we know that there is pain transmission. And we also know from some really interesting neuroimaging studies, so this is where an individual is, uh, has a special type of MRI done, and they are, their migraine is provoked in the machine. That then allows you to see which different parts of the brain are being activated or having decreased activity during a migraine attack. And you don't need to take on board all of the details of this slide, aside to say that if you compare what happens in a migraine sufferer's brain compared to a non-sufferer's brain, there are all sorts of different areas that light up as more active or less active. And of course, this is very likely to explain all the different symptoms that occur during a migraine attack. But really, that's kind of all we know. I mean, migraine's been around for a very long time. It's been recognized for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. But it's still a neurological <coughs> mystery. Where exactly in the brain does migraine start? Every single headache conference I attend, this is a topic that is debated. No one can agree yet. Why do some people have aura? And why do some people not have aura? What of those different pathways that are happening in the brain, all of those different places that Richard explained to you, which of those pathways are causing aura? What causes the nausea and vomiting? How is that linked to the brain? And why is the hypersensitivity to smell, sound, and light? And why is migraine more common in women than men? We have some answers, we have a lot of speculation, and we really are not at the bottom of this yet. And I think in part it's because this is a complex condition, it's hard to diagnose, it's hard to understand, but with research we are making progress. And so let's look a little bit about uh, now at migraine treatment. So firstly, as I said before, migraine has been around for a long time. And these are the types of treatments that have been used to try 
and relieve migraine. I, this is my favorite. I don't know what your favorite here is, but I mean, surely extensive controlled trials were done to show that binding a dead mole on the head was effective for migraine. I mean, where did these things come from? I don't know. Leeches. Now, that's a really common medieval treatment for pretty much everything. A recent article in the Daily Mail UK suggested that some people are still trying to use leeches to relieve migraine. Maybe there's truth in it. We don't understand the science. But, you know, people have tried a lot of things and are still trying a lot of things. One thing that was particularly popular at one stage was the hydroelectric bath which apparently did have some success. I mean, that so sounds like an absolute health and safety nightmare. <laughs> but I mean, this, this was used. Um, but in terms of where we are sort of now, in terms of migraine treatment, things have improved. And there was a huge breakthrough in 1991 with the approval of the first migraine-specific treatment. These are called the triptans, and a number of you will have heard of triptan drugs. Their origins actually come from contaminated grain. So there is a particular fungus that contaminates grain, or used to contaminate, gra contaminate grain, called ergot of rye. And this, in the Middle Ages, caused something called St. Anthony's fire, which was severe pain due to... Uh, blood vessels closing up. But what people started to understand was that maybe this effect could be used beneficially. And so they would start to make extracts of this and tinctures for medicinal purposes. And it was discovered that in some people this actually did help their migraine. And through a lot of medicinal chemistry, they found molecules or designed molecules based on the compounds that came out of this, creating this first triptan drug. So a really nice way of showing how nature has helped us to identify these drugs for migraine. And so what does modern medicinal migraine treatment look like? Well, there are two things. You have acute medications. So these are drugs that uh, you are told to take when you feel a migraine coming on. And these are to help blunt the migraine, stop it in its tracks. And so people will usually be told to take regular painkillers like paracetamol, or they'll be prescribed, or in combination, the triptan drugs that I mentioned to you, like Imigran or rise and melt. And these are all based on the same uh, type of mechanism. And these are effective for quite a number of patients, and these have been a tremendous advance. But they actually also can't be used by huge numbers of people. If you have any kind of uh, problem in your cardiovascular system, you're not allowed to take these drugs because they have side effects. And so whilst they are good for some people, they're not good for everyone. There are also some classes of preventative drugs. And these are really interesting because these were actually never designed for migraine. They've come from other therapeutic areas. So the current drugs for migraine prevention are actually depression drugs, high blood pressure drugs, and epilepsy drugs. And it was found that they did help some patients with migraine, and so they are approved for use and recommended for use for migraine. And that's why, again, a number of you here may take one or more of these. And taken every day, they can help some patients. But they certainly don't help everyone, and they do have side effects that really mean that people don't want to take them. If you look at the number of people who start taking these preventative medicines, they seem to manage to keep taking them often for about three months, and then they stop taking them. Why? Because they don't work, or they've got side effects. If they work for you, fantastic. If they don't, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, but what I am here to tell you about are some new things coming along. So there are some newer options, which are not uh, medicinal, 
but which are really interesting in the way they work. And so you have this type of nerve stimulation device. Um, this is one of these types of things. And you wear it on your forehead. Not something you want to go out for dinner wearing, obviously. <laughs> but something that, you know, in the privacy of your own home, used for the right amount of time as prescribed, can <coughs> help your migraine. And there's also Botox. You'd be more familiar with that from smoothing your creases and what everyone in Hollywood uses, but actually Botox has been found to be really useful in many migraine patients. When injected into specific sites in the, in the forehead, for example, this is thought to effectively um, stop the nerves from sending pain signals, and so this does work for many people. And you can um, get Botox treatment for migraine in New Zealand, but unfortunately this is not Pharmac funded at the present time, although they are campaigning for this. So there are some options, but modern medicinal migraine treatment is still inadequate. And large numbers of patients do not have effective treatment. Maybe they take a cocktail of things that can take the edge off or diminish attacks, but migraine is not abolished for a large number of people. So, so what do patients want from future migraine medicines? And if you're a migraine sufferer in the audience and you have not got an effective treatment, I'd like to know what you would like. What is going to work for you? But I believe they need to be effective. They need to be safe. They need to have few side effects. Ideally, they will prevent migraine and designed specifically for migraine on the basis that they affect migraine-specific mechanisms and not other things. And so I'm going to move on to the next part here, which is um, where we're going to talk about how some really interesting developments are now offering hope to sufferers. And so I'm really pleased to be able to announce to you that some new drugs have been approved for use in humans for preventing migraine. The first of these is this one here, Arenumab, with the trade name Imavig. This was approved by the US Food and Drug Administration and the European Regulatory Authority in mid-2018. <coughs> this is the first drug actually designed to prevent migraine based on underlying migraine mechanisms. It was the first drug in its class for its target, and I'll tell you about a couple of others later that are also now approved. And it targets a particular molecule called CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide. And I'll explain to you what that is. So we all have CGRP. Every one of us has this molecule called CGRP. It's a so-called neuropeptide. It's found in our nerves, and it modulates the activity of target cells. So it's made up of a sequence of amino acids. These are protein building blocks, and the unique way in which these are strung together creates unique biological molecules. So this is CGRP here. It's shown as just a little red dot here. It's packaged into nerve cells. And when this nerve cell is activated, CGRP is released and it acts on a special target site known as the receptor, leading to signaling within a cell. Now, this is an important concept, and so to make sure that you're all familiar with this, I'm just going to switch over to the document camera and just reinforce this point, because actually understanding what a CGRP receptor is is important for understanding other aspects of my talk. So is that up there? Everyone can see it? Good? All right. So this is where you see my potentially very bad left-handed writing, but uh, Richard encouraged me that being left-handed is a good thing. So, so what I've drawn here is the, the, a target cell. So that's the membrane of a target cell. This is outside the cell. This is inside the cell. And on the surface of that cell, <laughs> you'll find a protein called the CGRP receptor. And this is the specific protein 
that CGRP, once it's released from that nerve cell, there's CGRP, it will bind to that receptor, rather like putting a key into a lock. And what happens is that that will become activated. So there's the receptor again. Now CGRP has bound to its receptor like a key sli sl slitting into a lock, and that has now become activated. So that's now the active. CGRP receptor. And that is a critical step because what can happen now is that there is a transmission event. A message from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell has occurred, causing changes in chemical messengers inside the cell. And that causes the pain. Now, what's quite important about this is that CGRP only recognises a specific target. So, the key fits into this lock and not other locks necessarily, although I'll come back to that later and that's why this is important. <coughs> and it causes chemical changes in the cell that transmit pain. And this type of mechanism is really important for how all of our hormones work and for how about 30% of all medicines work. They work by having a specific molecule and a specific receptor creating specific effects. And so that's really what this uh, summary diagram here is showing. And so we know we all have CGRP and this is how it works. And we know that it modulates the activity of nerves that control pain. It also has other effects, like it's able to relax blood vessels. And knowing that blood vessels are involved in migraine shows this link. But its true role is still not known. But we do know that migraine sufferers have much higher levels of CGRP in their blood. So during a migraine attack, if we compare the, the amount of CGRP here outside of an attack and during an attack, you can see this is much higher. About four times more CGRP is released into the blood during a migraine attack. And this has been done by testing volunteers, testing blood samples from human volunteers outside and during a migraine. And so that was really important evidence that CGRP was indeed involved in migraine. But there's some more really compelling data. And that is that CGRP directly triggers migraine. And this experiment has been done um, in experimental human models of migraine. And this is where a migraine patient will come into a lab and they will be given an infusion into the arm of the CGRP peptide. Their blood vessels can be monitored and they'll also then provide a score of how much their headache has come on. And this is fantastic work done at the Danish Headache Center um, in Copenhagen. And I had the privilege of visiting some fantastic young scientists there late last year who are doing a number of studies where they infuse different triggers, different molecules into migraine sufferers who happily volunteer for this even though it will give them a migraine potentially, because it helps us discover new migraine targets. So using this type of experimental setup, if you give CGRP to a non-sufferer, they will only get a very mild headache. But if you give CGRP to a migraine sufferer, they will get migraine. 80% of people will get a migraine. So that shows that migraine sufferers are sensitized to CGRP it seems to work more in people with migraine. And so this illustrates this. In a migraine sufferer, there is more CGRP that activates more CGRP receptors, leading to more pain signals. 
So it's as if the whole system is dialed up in a migraine sufferer. But what's really important, and that's where these new drugs come into play, is that we can block this. We can stop these effects. We can either take a molecule like this one here, plug it into the active site of that receptor, that stops that pain signaling, and that can stop a migraine in its tracks. There are also some <coughs> antibody types of drugs which are designed to either bind to this receptor and stop it working, or to mop up the CGRP, the excess CGRP in the bloodstream. And all of these different mechanisms have been proven in clinical trials to reduce migraine in migraine sufferers. And what there has been is huge pharmaceutical industry uh, excitement in this worldwide. They've been working for decades on this mechanism and racing to the finish line. As I indicated, Amgen won this race with Arenumab, but there are lots of other molecules in development or now approved. So the first ones were approved in late 2018, and more are expected this year. And so right now, what has been approved are these three. You have Imavig, AGV, and Mgality. These all work in similar ways to stop CGRP in its tracks. Now, at the moment, these are devices rather like an insulin pen, which you have a small injection once a month or four times a year. And this can help many patients. But of course, there is a big con here. They are expensive. So the price of these in the US is nearly $7,000 per year. And of course, the critical question is, what does this mean in New Zealand? Who can access these and how much do they cost? Now, I spoke to a, neurology, uh, a neurologist colleague recently um, because I wanted to make sure I had the update information to tell you. And she said that there should be some availability in New Zealand within months. But for now, this will not be Pharmac funded. However, an application to Pharmac should be made later in 2019. Now, we can't make any promises. We can just hope and campaign to make these available through Pharmac. And so this shows here a summary of all the different clinical trials. So it's a bit of a complex slide, but what we're looking at are those small molecule antagonist drugs on the left and the antibody drugs on the right. And the important uh, color is the blue bar. And this shows the number of patients or the percentage of patients who have been effectively treated with that drug. And what you'll see is that none of these go to 100%. This is actually 50 here. Overall, only about 50% of patients respond to treatment. So they are fantastic, they are working for people, but they're not working for everyone. And so there are really important questions here, such as whether we can do better. And so just for the last few minutes, I'm going to highlight how a few questions, many questions remain unanswered and highlight just a little bit of some of our work in this area. So the CGRP-directed drugs so far they do work, but they don't work for everyone. And this is only the beginning. Many questions remain. We don't know exactly how they work. We don't know whether they could be used for other conditions. Now, I haven't talked about this today, but there's another condition, for example, cluster headache. This is much rarer than migraine, but it's also known as suicide headache. This is more common in men, and that name gives you a clue as to how debilitating this is. It comes on in clusters of attacks which are very severe, and then they go away for a while. There are not very many effective treatments for this. So are these new drugs useful for that? There are ongoing clinical trials which are showing promise. Why do some patients respond and others don't? That 50% that I said is the average across those clinical trials. 
If you actually look in detail at those clinical trials, you'll see that there are some patients who just aren't responding at all to these drugs, and others who have been classified as super responders. And these are people who, since their first or second dose, have never had a migraine again. Imagine a chronic migrainer with 15 or more headache days per month who now no longer has migraine. That's incredibly significant, but we don't understand why those patients are responding so well. We don't know whether there will be any long-term side effects. CGRP is a natural molecule that we all have. If we block it forever, is that a problem? So far, the safety data looks great, but we just don't know. And can we make better drugs that are more cost-effective than these antibodies and available to more migraine sufferers? And are there any other targets like CGRP? If not everyone is responding to a CGRP blocker, does that mean there's other things out there that we haven't yet discovered? Well, actually, there is something else which we have discovered through a similar type of a human study, it's, it's another horrible acronym, it's called PACAP, and I won't go through the name, but that also can trigger migraine in migraine sufferers. And there are companies who are also developing molecules to try and block that. We're trying to figure out whether if we use both together, will that be even better? And so, in my lab here in New Zealand, we're doing world-leading and world-challenging molecular pharmacological studies on CGRP receptors in the context of migraine to help find those answers. <coughs> now, I say world challenging because this is actually quite important. I went through that uh, scheme before where I said that you have a lock and you have a key. And there is the key, CGRP, but there's usually only one lock. We've discovered CGRP has two locks, not one, so are we missing half of the story? Is that why maybe we haven't successfully treated everyone yet? Because actually, CGRP is finding another pathway to go down. So that's pretty important. And I've been out there telling the world this, and they are listening. Now, for those who don't uh, know the term pharmacology, this is what we do in my lab, pharmacology. And this is about understanding drugs or medicines. And it's about trying to develop new ones and understand how current ones work. So we have a molecular pharmacology lab. And what we're trying to do is work to understand all of the pieces of this puzzle. So this is what I showed you before, and I've just converted that into a jigsaw puzzle. We have to understand every single piece of this to really understand this system. So we know that these receptors are essential proteins for transmitting messages in cells. We know that around half of all medicines out there act in this kind of way by targeting receptors. And we were asking how many CGRP receptors are there? And I've just told you there's actually two, not one, as was commonly believed. We're trying to find them in the brain using the uh, brain bank that Richard described to you before. That's a fantastic resource for helping us to pinpoint exactly where in the brain these receptors are found. That helps us understand migraine. It helps us treat migraine. And we're also trying to understand the exact molecular blueprint of these receptors. It's shown here as a little blob. Of course, it's not a blob. It's a really complex thing and we're trying to understand how it works. So I'm just going to show you one little piece of data which is giving us new insights into CGRP receptors. Now, what you've got on the screen here are some cells, like Richard showed you before. And what we've done with these cells is we've added a fluorescent label to the CGRP peptide, and we've added that to the cells. And what happens at the well-known CGRP receptor is it starts to disappear inside the cell. And you're going to find that quite difficult to see, but what you might be able to see occurring over this time course, that you get bright spots appearing inside these cells. And what's happening here is that CGRP is binding to its receptor, and it's being removed from the cell surface to stop it signaling, to stop it transmitting messages. And that's the normal way that these things work. 
But what we found is that at the second receptor that we've discovered, this behaves really differently. You do exactly the same experiment, you apply the same concentration of this labelled CGRP, and you apply it to the cells, and what happens is it doesn't go inside, it stays on the cell surface, which means that this second receptor might be capable of signalling and transmitting pain messages much more than this one. So maybe we need to be focusing our attentions here. Maybe that's going to help us make better migraine drugs. And this is the work of some really talented um, young scientists in my lab uh, who are doing fantastic work. And so what I'd just like to close up and do now to give plenty of time for questions is just show you some useful resources. For those of you who want to find out more about migraine, there's something really important happening right now, and this is the Migraine World Summit. This is a virtual conference <coughs> online, which is free for this week. If you register, I'm hoping you should be able to access lots of information from leading world experts in this space. So free and online is the Migraine World Summit right now. I encourage you to have a look at that because you might find some answers that you need. The American Migraine Foundation has some really fantastic resources on its website. It can help you as a patient understand what type of headache you have. If you're caring for a child with migraine, this will give you some helpful um, suggestions. It's got useful brochures on understanding the new anti-CGRP treatments. There's also a website called cgrpforum.org, and that is also an educational resource for researchers, patients, and clinicians in the CGRP space. And there's also a write-up uh, in the September 2018 issue of North and South around these new CGRP treatments and migraine in general. So if you're interested in this, I encourage you to look at some of these resources. So I'd just like to close by thanking you for your attention. I hope you've learned something new about migraine, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you have, either now or at the end in person, if you don't want to speak up. So thank you. So we'll just get some microphones to make sure everyone can hear. There was a question there. Yep. I haven't um, seen a neurologist yet, but I would get a migraine headache every day, but I take medication that pretty quickly gets rid of it. Preventative, so I've tried two now through my GP, one fairly recently. Second one is, you know, the amitriptyline. I'm having to increase the dose all the time. And so it seems my body sort of gets used to it a bit situated, if that's the word. And so I suppose I'm wondering, I feel like, I'm a nurse, I feel like I would be good to see a neurologist to sort of see if, you know, what is available right now and what are the options for me, because a good GP, but he doesn't have the specialised knowledge. So, I mean, all neurologists or most neurologists sort of know about this stuff? I would definitely encourage you to see a neurologist because they are more specialists than GPs and they will often have more time to speak to you and I think that's important. Um, there are not a lot of specialist neurologists but most neurologists will be familiar in this space. Since we still don't know exact how exactly some uh, CGRP related drugs are working, so why are they allowed to use in foreign countries? So, we know, that, we know that CGRP triggers migraine, we know that people with migraine have more CGRP, and we know that if we give one of these drugs, that can stop migraine happening. So we do know a bit about how they work, and we know that they do work for many people. There are lots of tiny details in that picture, like that jigsaw puzzle, that we don't know. And so that's what I was referring to. We know enough to show they're safe, to show they're effective. But what I'm suggesting is that there is more to learn 
so that we can make them better in the future. Um, you, um, is there a, um, a relation between concentrations of um, CGRP and hereditary passing on of um, migraines? Uh, so, there are different forms of migraine, including inherited forms of migraine. Uh, and I think there is not a strong link necessarily in those particular forms of migraine to CGRP in particular. Um, but I would have to check the studies specifically, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so you say you know enough to know they're safe. What does that mean? That, how, like, how long have they been taken for? They've, They've been, been taken, taken in some patients for now a couple of years. So the, whilst the drugs have only just been approved by regulatory authorities, there have been ongoing clinical trials in many different countries now for several years. And that data is, is publicly available. So the most common side effects are an injection site reaction, and that's very common with any kind of injectable drug, that at the site at which you administer it, there will be a, a rash or something similar. But generally speaking, there don't seem to be other problems. Um, now, these have gone into thousands of patients, but I guess we just won't know until they're widely out there in the market to know if there will be any other issues. But what you should know is that people are really paying a lot of close attention to this and monitoring it very carefully. And that's the case with any new drug. So, uh, just to clarify, you said 50% of people were receiving benefits. So, that's like, so the number needed to treat with these drugs is two. So, for every two people that take them with migraines, one will get less pain within six months. The 50% is an average. average yeah. It's an average. And you will see some patients are 100% responders. Um, and others are not getting any benefit at all. And it's not clear yet whether there's a genetic basis or anything else as to why that's the case. I think there was a question in the middle here and then up at the back. Hi, I'm just wondering, um, with the research you're talking about with the CRGP, is there anything done with paediatrics around this and the blocking drugs? With there is a lot of commentary going on in the clinical literature around this at the moment. Um, I am not sure whether any specific trials are going on, but it's certainly something that people are thinking about. What's actually happening yet, I'm not sure. But it's certainly an area that there are a lot of conversations among um, headache researchers going on. And do you know anything with regards to use, the use of melatonin in children? With um, No, I don't know no. about that. All right, okay, thanks. So, up the back there. Hi, thank you very much. Um, with the CGRP and the trigeminal aspect that you mentioned, is there any CGRP aspects that they've investigated with trigeminal neuralgia? Yes, that's a really good question. Um, I think there will very likely be some involvement, but it's not been studied very much. <laughs> Uh, but trigeminal neuralgia uh, is another place where it's possible these drugs could be useful. But I'm not sure of the exact studies that are going on on that at the moment. Hello. Are there any known triggers for a hemiplegic migraine? Hemiplegic migraine is not something I know a lot about, unfortunately. So I would not like to speculate specifically on that. Would you suggest a neurologist might help? Absolutely. Thank you. I hope they would be able to. Thank I you. can't guarantee that, but I would hope. Thank you. Uh, my question is related. Uh, you're talking about this new drugs that could block the CGRP. How about uh, old drugs like a Panadol? Is it kind of similar effect or different principles? No, could you different. Just give us a little bit more. Different principles. And one of the problems is that uh, all the general pain medications are for pain generally, and that isn't exactly the same as head pain. So. They kind of work, and they do help some people, and they will take the edge off, and maybe they will abolish it for you. But they, they will influence pain generally, but not specifically head pain. And it, they don't seem to involve CGRP. Please, 
That's a really great question. So um, migraine is underdiagnosed and it's difficult to diagnose, especially when it doesn't always come with a headache and when there are so many different diverse symptoms associated with migraine. And people are constantly updating the criteria worldwide to make sure we get better, more adequate diagnoses. So the question was, are those trial results with the 50% average responders related to not good diagnosis? I think in this case the answer is no, because those are done very carefully with headache specialists and the, they won't be allowed into the trial unless they have got a very clear diagnosis. But it's a good question. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Um, one woman recently posted online that she used a clip between her thumb and her pointer finger. Do you think that would work? There are many anecdotes online, many, many anecdotes online, and the leech example was kind of one of these. Maybe there's a basis for it, but, you know, as a scientist, I'm driven by robust clinical studies. Um, and the thing with migraine in particular is that you have a very high placebo effect because you really want benefit. And it's remarkable actually how if you were to look back at those slides and I won't flick back, the placebo rate for those who didn't get active drug was very high. And is that because they are now just being cared for better? They are now actually seeing a headache specialist they are actually thinking carefully about their triggers. And there are many anecdotes, and I think it's something we really don't understand at all. Um, and th there's little, sometimes there's little harm in trying these things, but always weigh up the harm versus potential benefit for anything like that. So who is, who's been waiting a while? Because okay. I'm a bit lost with... Ah, okay, sorry. That's all right. Um, I just wanted to know the new treatments that are coming out, would they have the same effectiveness on people with TBI and migraines? So that's traumatic brain injury um, and migraine. The, the research on traumatic brain injury and CGRP, there isn't a lot of it yet. There's some very early studies that may be showing a linkage between CGRP and traumatic brain injury, but it's too early, and I'm not aware that there are specifically trials yet on that. It's something that people are thinking about, like I said with trigeminal neuralgia, but no clear data. Um, with migraines and brain tumours, uh, should they be seen as uh, symptomatic of each other or should they be seen as two separate entities? I would say probably separate entities. Yeah. You touched on um, cluster headaches. Are, are they vastly different from migraine? I think that's more what I suffer from and I've never heard it called um, suicide headaches before but I can understand why. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, they are different but cluster headache is studied even less than migraine is. So if you think back to the, um, some of the statistics I had right at the beginning about how common migraine is, okay, if you attend one of the biggest conferences in the world on research in this area and clinical conferences, you might have a thousand people attending. If you go to one on diabetes, there'll be 20,000 attending. So there is a huge disproportion situation here between how many people this affects and how much research there actually is going on. Cluster headache is a small proportion of that. And so I think that from my understanding, the mechanisms are distinct, but given that CGRP does appear to be effective or some of these are effective, maybe there's some commonality there that we've yet to uncover. Okay, one last question there. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you know of any correlation between migraine diagnoses and other brain diseases. So you talked about other 
medications which we have found effective in treating migraine because of other things, but I didn't notice any brain dis- um, so, medicines So, I mean, epilepsy medicines are used for migraine, for example. Um, it, it comes back in part to the diagnosis issue because, for example, if you have an acute migraine attack and end up in the emergency department, they will spend a lot of time checking whether you have stroke. And so, actually, there, there is a, a real issue with trying to understand um, and diagnose this. And I think there are a lot of linkages. What the solid linkages are, uh, I, I couldn't say. So, in terms of time, I better end there, but I'd be happy to talk further um, if you would like to. Okay, I'd like to ask. Thank, thank you. Thank you.